Have you ever realized that you make sounds when you breathe or sneeze or when you eat an apple or crisps? Have you ever thought about the fact that those sounds can be annoying to someone else? Did you know that they can be so annoying that the person who is irritated by them wants to hit you or even kill you? I didn't until one day I met that patient. She came on a Tuesday. As always, the secretary referred her to the waiting room. But this time she warned me that the patient was more irritated, more desperate and, and angry than others. I thanked her with a smile for pointing the finger. Every secretary is a psychiatrist. And as I strolled to the waiting room, I routinely flipped through the file of the patient. Last week, she had thrown the television through the living room, the doctor noted in a referral letter. As she was my last patient for that day. I had spoken to hundreds of them in the past few years. I knew them, inside and outside, as an expert and researcher in psychiatry should do. I knew their history, their complaints, their despair and their bleak future. I knew the clinical picture, the guidelines and the treatments, the important scientific articles and the latest findings. I read about it and I wrote about it. I thought about it day and night as obsessively as my patients succumbed to their intrusive thoughts and as compulsively as they carried out their pathological rituals. I was the expert of their suffering. I was an expert in obsessive compulsive disorder. And that justified my scientific obsession. Good afternoon, madam. How can I help you? I asked with a friendly smile. And the woman, small in stature, in her mid-forties, neatly but simply dressed, with sharp, watchful eyes, did not answer my smile. She came straight to the point. When I hear someone sneeze, I get so angry that I want to kill that person. I cannot let go of that thought. Every day I'm constantly working on it. It ruins my life. When someone sneezes, I can no longer hold on. I want to hit, to bite, scratch. I can't stand the sound. It makes me furious. She started crying. I nervously shoved on my chair. I hadn't heard this before, but I was worried too. All my life I've been suffering from hay fever, and especially in spring, the sneezing can suddenly strike me. I clenched my fist unseen in my trouser pocket, crammed around a paper handkerchief that could hold my body in check. I knew for sure what it, what it wasn't, but not what it was. I understood her suffering, but not her illness. It was not an obsessive compulsive disorder. I could not help her and disappointed she left my consulting room. Now I became impatient, irritated, desperate and angry because I did not understand. I was the expert after all. Nowhere could I place her symptoms in no syndrome, in no disorder. No matter how I tilted the picture, shifted my gaze or turned my perspective, adapted my vision, there was no disease describing her symptoms. Her riddle became my obsession. And yet I forgot her 
for the next day other patients came and others came and the day after so that her case disappeared into oblivion. One day a friend addressed me in Amsterdam six years later. Could I help him with a nasty problem his girlfriend had been struggling with for some time? And I agreed. The next day I saw a young blushing woman. She was ashamed but began to tell me cautiously, I get these thoughts that I want to strangle my friend. Because of the sound of his breathing, it makes me angry. I like to see him, but we can't lie in a bed together anymore. When I hear him breathing at night, I want to kill him. And she too started to cry. Two women becoming aggressive, hearing other people's sounds, irritating them immensely, struggling with loss of control over their feelings because of immense aggression, and finally avoiding any situation where the sound can be heard. That could not be a coincidence. Yet there was nothing in the books. There were no guidelines, no treatments, no scientific articles or latest findings. I walked through the past, looked for clues in forgotten psychiatry books. Maybe I have missed it. We placed an advertisement in our department. And in barely two weeks, over 40 patients with the same complaints came forward. We described the clinical picture and defined criteria based on their symptoms. We demarcated the disorder and gave it the name Sonothuria, a rage about sounds, human sounds. We suggest that sonophuria should be classified as a discrete psychiatric disorder. Until a co-worker noticed a name that was already in circulation on the internet, misophonia. To avoid confusion, we borrowed the name for our new psychiatric disorder, misophonia. Five years later, at our department, we diagnosed over 2,000 patients and treated more than 1,000 patients. We defined criteria, developed a scale, a mesos. We described the dysfunction in the brain's early auditory processing systems in misophonic patients. We showed in an open trial that behavioral therapy reduced symptoms. Nearly 50% of the patients showed a significant reduction of misophonic systems. We collected brain imaging data and proved that patients engaged brain circuits associated with more cognitive control than normal subjects. We exposed the patients with symptom-provoking audiovisual stimuli, and our results demonstrated that audiovisual stimuli trigger anger and physiological arousal in patients with misophonia, associated with activation of the auditory cortex and the salience network in the brain. Finally, we found structural and functional abnormalities which implicate dysfunction of emotional and attentional systems in misophonic patients. The higher connectivity between the left amygdala and the cerebellum may explain the tendency to exhibit reflex-like physical reactions to triggers, aggressive reactions. We replicated the validity and reliability of our previously defined criteria in our earlier findings in a larger study in over 800 subjects with misophonia. We replicated as well our behavioral therapy trial for misophonia in a randomized clinical fashion. The cognitive behavioral treatment had an observed clinical improvement in nearly 40% of the patients compared to 0-1 in the waiting list group. Misophonia. It is written now about all over the world, and some still do not believe the diagnosis. But those who ever heard of their suffering will not forget it.